So a second type of um, interaction between two species is categorized as predation. That's the use of one species as a food resource by another species. And these come in um, a variety of forms. First is a true predator, and that would be shown here in the slide, the coyote. So a true predator hunts its food and consumes most of the other organism as its food. So true predators include things like coyotes, um, the great horned owl, um, humans, were all true predators, or can be. A second category is herbivores, and you may not typically think of that as predation, but it is. So the example I've shown here is a cow eating grass. So it's still eating the grass. It doesn't kill the grass, but um, unless there were too many cows, of course, but it does consume the grass, and therefore it is a predator. A third type of predator is a parasite. A parasite is an organism which attaches itself either to another organism or actually inside that other organism. And um, a parasite may or may not actually kill its host. Usually a single parasite would not, um, but there are parasites that can kill the host. Uh, and there's also something called a parasitoid which is an organism that lays its eggs inside of another organism. And when the eggs develop and eventually hatch, um, they, they feed upon that organism. And then once they hatch, the organism is killed. And so that's common for wasps and certain flies. Uh, I want to give you one other example that I haven't shown here. And that's the tapeworm. So a tapeworm in dogs, if you have a moment to go online and take a look at what that picture looks like, it's really awful. These worms multiply and um, cover the dog's heart and eventually cause it damage. And take one look at that picture, and I guarantee you won't forget to give your dog your, its heartworm medicine. So that's predation. Another interaction between species can be categorized as commensalism. And a fourth is mutualism, so they're not the same thing. Commensalism, one species benefits, but the other isn't harmed, and it isn't helped either. But one species benefits. When you have mutualism, both species benefit. So the example on the left is commensalism, and that's a bromeliad. It's similar to an orchid and it grows up high in trees, and that allows it to get its water, since it doesn't have true roots, and gives it some protection. And so it benefits, the bromeliad benefits, but it doesn't harm or help the tree that it, in which it resides. The example of mutualism is on the right, and there is a bird called an oxpecker and a rhinoceros shown here in the photograph. So the birds eat bugs or insects that are on the hides of the rhinoceros. That benefits the bird because that's a source of food. And that benefits the rhinoceros because then it doesn't have uh, damage to it, its hide. So it's protective for it. So that's mutualism. This is just a table which summarizes the different types of interactions between species and as to whether one or both species can benefit or, or um, be harmed. And if it's neutral, then there's a zero here. Now I want to point out one other important type of relationship, which is the symbiotic relationship. In a symbiotic relationship, two species live in close association. That symbiotic relationship can overlap many of these categories. The relationship may be commensalism, where both benefit, excuse me, where one benefits, yes, where one benefits and the other isn't harmed or hurt. It could be mutualism, where both benefit, and it could also be parasitism, where one organism harms the other. So I want to point out just one important example of a symbiotic relationship, 
and that is lichen. And lichen consists of a an algae and a fungus that live together in close association. And the algae performs photosynthesis, which provides food. And the fungus has a strong structure um, that allows water to be trapped, and so that benefits the photosynthetic algae. So they both benefit together, and they're always found in close association. It could be a variety of different species that are making up the uh, symbiotic, symbiotic relationship. Okay, just a few more terms to wrap up this chapter and uh, about populations and species. Here we're looking at a species known as a keystone species. If you take a look back at the term keystone when you're talking about building a building, the keystone is that first cornerstone that, that anchors and, and causes the foundation for the others, um, the rest of the building. And in the case of the ketones, the keystone species, it's a species that plays a large role in its community. And the role that it plays is far more important than the number of that species that are present. So a species that plays a role in the community, it is far more important than its relative abundance might suggest. So an example here is a beaver. So you're only going to find a few beavers in a particular area, but as you probably know, they build dams behind which water collects. And that might be critical for a particular habitat in that when it goes enters into a dry season, there's still um, a source of food or, or living conditions, which are, are water. And so that can affect the, a larger number of species, so it's considered a keystone species. Okay, one of the last topics we'll look at, the last topic we'll look at here is, so we've been talking about pop individuals, populations, and then communities. The makeup or the composition of a community can change over time due to many factors. So the typical progression of a community is from a community that doesn't really contain any species, so just exposed rock. Then you get certain types of species like lichens and mosses, and those species break down the rocks and um, turn it into soil. And the more soil you get, the deeper soil you get, and the more nutrient-rich soil you get, you then progress through annual weeds, perennial weeds and grasses, then slightly larger shrubs, and then you get your trees like aspen, cherry, and young pine trees, and eventually you might end up with, in this example, a beech and maple broadleaf forest. And at that point, the soil is, is very deep. So that process is called ecological succession, meaning a succession of um, species that are present in a particular community in a particular place. And that's primary succession, starting from bare rock. There's also a pro um, process of secondary succession, which occurs after primary succession has occurred. So you've gotten to some point along the line here with primary succession, maybe even to the point of a broadleaf forest, and something major happens, something major like a volcanic eruption, which takes out the trees. Um, it could be uh, a large fire. It could be the building of a human community, like a city that's knocking down the trees and paving over. So after that, there's already a deeper soil, depending on what point this event happened. So when um, something happens, the community that occurs through secondary succession, it's not going to follow the same progression as uh, the initial primary succession because the soil is deeper and allows for a different progression. So, for example, um, there's an area behind my house that was, the land was fought over, whether it was owned by the town of Barnstable or a family. Um, eventually, the court decided that it uh, belonged to the family, which eventually chose to try to develop the land. So they built a road that went down, oh, maybe 
three or four houses long road and then and they paved that um, took down the trees on either side of the, the slopes there and then no houses were built the economy went into a funk and there weren't houses built there for many years so at first my children were able to go sledding down those hills because they were completely um, denuded and then eventually we started getting some weeds and some um, then some perennial grasses and eventually some shrubs which really blocked the sledding pathways and not too long after that um, we have scrub pines have all come in and now they're getting quite tall and so they can come in more quickly um, this process here takes many periods of time at least 100 years but once you have soil you can jump through this progression the secondary succession much more quickly okay so just review the key concepts um, about biodiversity its importance uh, the different levels, <coughs> excuse me, from genes <clears throat> all the way through ecosystem. Understand the process of evolution and how that can lead to increased biodiversity. Also understand um, the process of extinction and how humans may um, increase the rate of extinction. Um, understand that there are different ecological niches and species distribution based on all of these evolutionary changes and that each species plays an ecological role in the ecosystem where it's found that's called its ecological niche and that human activities are decreasing the earth's biodiversity by causing premature extinction of species often from disrupting habitats um, but also over harvesting in, um, introducing invasive species um, <clears throat> habitat destruction, did I say that one already? And climate change. Okay, that's a wrap for chapter four.